Yeah, hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Keep Up in Qatar. We're still excited and pumped from the Socceroos' one new win over Tunisia. However, attention has started to turn towards Denmark and finding out a lot about our opponents who will face for a spot in the round of 16. David Wiener with you once again, joined by Tom Smithy and David Davudovic here in Doha, still following the Socceroos closely. Gentlemen, Hope you're both well. We're both in, we haven't seen much of each other today because we've both in, been in different parts of the city. Tom, you and I have been following Denmark. Tom, uh, Dave, you were at the Socceroos this morning. What was the buzz like when Mitchell Juve was put up for everyone to chat to? Yeah, really good. Uh, everyone was uh, was firing on all cylinders today. It was uh, great to see the goal scorer, the Socceroos hero, come out, and he was uh, more than happy to. Uh, to front the press pack as well. So um, yeah, it was all you know very positive, a lot of questions about his reflections of uh, Saturday, whatever day it was, I've completely lost my bearings. Um, the goal, the beautiful moment with his son Jackson, and again, he got quite emotional speaking about it, talking about the fact that uh, it was the first time that his son and daughter uh, have been able to, to see him play um, and share that, that beautiful moment. He gave a, a great shout out to the directors also, um, rightly pointed out that they did superbly to uh, to capture um, his son doing that celebration, which is a, a really good point. Yeah, well, the best in the business are here, that's for sure. Tom, you've written a nice feature on Mitchell Jiggles on the Keep Up app at the moment because I guess the beauty, and I guess what's what sort of the trio here, what we get so invested and emotional in it, is you followed these guys since they first broke through in the A-Legs, like when they were teenagers breaking through. Mitchell Duke's one of them, you would have seen him closely at Central Coast, you've heard anecdotes from him at Central Coast, and you've shared a few of them in the piece that's up today. Yeah, that, that whole um, young squad of players that Graham Arnold brought through, the Mariners of Mitch Duke, um, Frank Sainsbury, Matt Ryan, and Bernie Abini, um, there were, it was a, a, a squad that was studded with young, young talent. Um, Mitch Duke always stood out even then for, for more for his hard work than, than anything else. Uh, I mean, Ryan was obviously a, a young star and Trent Sainsbury was calm on the ball even then, but um, Jeep was just bustling and strong and powerful. But um, you know, we mentioned this in the podcast the other day, but um, he, he, he was literally playing five side with his mates, even when he'd been given a professional contract. He just, just wanted to play, just wanted to keep kicking the ball around. It's, it's pretty simple. And he's had the, the ups and downs, the, the really crappy time in Saudi Arabia. Um, Really, but you know, we, we forget that he's, he played for four years in the J League, mm. um, almost 100 appearances for Shimizu, uh, did it, his ACL in the middle of that, um, still got uh, played under four different coaches, they all rated him, uh, but he was just sort of out of sight, out of mind, he got an appearance, a few appearances of the EFF Cup under Holger in 2013, mm. and then that Brazil game when soccer has got smashed 6-0 late in 2013, mm. he was in that squad, and then not a, not a cent until six, almost six years later when he got recalled by um, Graham Arnold for the South Korea friendly in 2019. That's a long time between international drinks. And I know he's played out, out of position a lot when he was in the J League. He was playing as a, a winger or a, a wing back. So I don't think he necessarily got to put his, his best foot forward back then, but he certainly making up for lost time. Sure is. And showing that he's with that goal, showing the world and showing Australian fans that he's got so much more, so many more qualities than just being a, a hard worker. You know, the defensive presser and that kind of thing. So, great stuff, great story. And so is, guys, the story that we are very keen on and we are very proud of, which is the fact that so many of this squad are not just uh, former Asuzu Youth A-League players and graduates, but two of the front three starting players are from the league that we follow so passionately. And at one point, we nearly had a combination where Jamie McLaren came on as a substitute and combined with the three of them with the ball whisking just past Matthew Leckie's studs. Dave, Kai Rolls and uh, Mitchell Duke both this morning were asked about the contribution of the A-Leagues to the Socceroos and also the fact that, you know, part of this wonderful exposure the game's getting right now with fantastic ratings on SBS, 1.7 million or something like that, prime time on Saturday night, is awareness of the fact that the A-Leagues is on, that the A-Leagues is competitive and that you can step up from that competition and take on the very best in the world. I think both of the guys spoke really, really well about not only their thoughts on the A-League, but the way that Australians and even global football people can perceive the competition once this competition here at the World Cup is over. Correct, they could not have been uh, more glowing uh, in speaking about the A-League. Vince Rigari from the Sydney Morning Herald uh, asked each of them um, a question a about that. And uh, yeah, Mitch Duke in particular was really strong talking about how you know there are so many 
Socceroos fans out there, many of whom wouldn't, uh, you know, follow necessarily follow the A League in between. But uh, he hopes that some of those will jump on board their local teams or whoever it is. Uh, maybe don't even need to follow a team; just you know, tune in on Ten and Paramount Plus and read from Keep Up and the Keep Up app with all your uh, latest A League news. But uh, yeah, he, he definitely was strong in saying that the A League is underrated mm. and. I think this World Cup has uh, has absolutely proven that. And Kai was also, um, you know, really strong and really bullish on it. I actually caught up with Kai Rolls in August over in, in Scotland at Hearts and, and he just spoke about how the A-Leaks have had given him such a, a strong foundation. I mean, to go firstly into those those playoff qualifiers against <coughs> UAE and Peru, he was immense in those games, particularly yeah. against Peru. He was an A-League player back then. He, he mm. played his last game was the, uh, the A-League All-Stars game. He hadn't played, I think his last A-League game would have been, what, a month or so yeah. prior to those actual qualifiers. So again, with that in mind, epic performance. And that's nothing to sneeze at, sneeze at either, the opportunity that the league gives, or the fact that that period where Kyle Rolls went from A-League's defender to playing in the All-Stars, to getting his soccer rules that move, to getting that move overseas, then the World Cup qualifiers, they're the opportunities that the league can give. And uh, Tom, uh, part of the language that the guys used today as well was, we want to turn some heads. Like, this is, the World Cup is obviously the biggest stage and the pinnacle of our sport. And on that stage, it has been the ultimate advertisement for this competition, that Craig Woodward and Matt Lecky, who are applying their trade week in, week out in the A-Leagues, were able to transfer that uh, into a... In, let, let's not beat around the bush. A match-winning contribution. Uh, okay, it was more defensively against Tunisia, but absolutely stood up and looked every bit a World Cup-worthy player on that stage. And the really important message people have got to, to understand is that going back a year, so a number of more of these players were already were playing in mm. so and there, some of them went to the Olympics. Yep. Now they're fully fledged internationals that are playing in the World Cup. So the new, the, each new generation is coming through. It's the opportunity to see those those kids before they. Garan Kowal, you know, mm. Mariners fans are going to have a tiny window still, and other fans to see him before he goes to Newcastle in January. And then others will follow, go overseas, and more will come through the ranks. And this is the the key thing is that's what you go to see at the in the end. And if anyone, I mean, just to provide that context, okay, we beat Tunisia, a lot of people probably don't know too much about Tunisia, don't rate them too highly, but I'll just quickly go through some of the clubs that the Tunisian players play for. Talbi, the right back, Lorient in, front, in France, Salernitana in Italy, uh, Luzerne in Switzerland, Ferenc Vardos, that's Le Duny, the, the mad midfielder, but all right, Hungarian league, maybe not one of the top five leagues in the world, but he was the best and fairest there last year. Decent competition. Uh, Keon in Germany, Shakiri, the midfielder, Kahn in France, Bronby, Denmark, OB, Denmark, Al Arabi, one of the big clubs in Asia. They're not Mickey Mouse clubs. So again, our players with a strong A-League contingent beat this team. That is a bloody good team. And we know this. What is so exciting about this opportunity is what the platform gives us. Saturday night on SBS, 1.7 million, mainstream talking about it. It's the platform to showcase what we know and what A-Leagues fans know and what these players know. And as Miss Duke said, turn some heads now so that they continue to follow those, follow this competition when it finishes. And we speak a lot about a new generation having their Kaiser start at the moment. So the Algernon new moment for the, for the, you know, the teenagers of, of now. Now, if those teenagers are not fans of the A-Leagues, but are sitting there going to Federation Square watching this game, and they want to experience that again in two weeks' time, where can they go? They go down to the local A-League game. So the cycle here is absolutely critical, and it's just fantastic to hear the guys who've come through the system, because Mr. Duke and Kyle Rolls don't play there now, to hear them talk about it, that's, for me, super powerful and, and, and a really exciting opportunity for our sport off the back of the World Cup. In fact, if they want to go and see some live football, they can do it immediately because uh, in my inbox this morning dropped a couple of things. First, the Keep Up email with all the stories that we've been writing and followed by an email from my local association pointing to the Liberty Elite Pass that That's all journeys to junior players can get to go and see a game for free. This was an ad pointing towards the Sydney Derby. Yes. Um, so there is, uh, there's multiple fronts on which you can go and watch excellent life football. And to conclude this point as well, I think that, that we don't shirk away from it all is we've, uh, there's a new show, The Dub Zone, on, which is to highlight the Liberty A-League and, and we want to make a, a, a real song and dance the fact that, yes, we know the World Cup's on right now, but get your local fix at the Liberty, Liberty A-League, take your kids along to experience that, particularly ahead of the Women's World Cup, 
And then the World Cup showcases around that when the World Cup finishes, the meat and drink of what we do is our local league. Yeah, it's a really good point. I mean, an amazing nine month period, yeah, we've got this World Cup happening at the moment, Socceroos within touching distance of a an historic round of 16 birth, and then- Do you know today, in, I was doing the maths, I was like, oh my God, we're gonna make the quarterfinals, maybe the semi-finals. <laughs> nah, I was like, get back, Denmark, I, Denmark. I had that moment as well. Started working out all the permutations from the other group, all if we uh, evade Argentina and Messi, and then it's like, okay, hang on, we got this Denmark game to play. Don't get ahead of yourselves, so. I think uh, Graham Arnold, that was a message that he was passing on yeah. to the players too. But uh, going back to my point before yeah, you get me off, Dave, um, there's a World Cup here in nine months uh, that we're hosting. In, in, we're, in Qatar? <laughs> we're, we're talking to an Australian audience, I thought. <laughs> it is the warehouse of the morning here. But what an amazing period for Australian football. The Women's World Cup will be a huge tournament. I don't think people realise how big this will be. And, you know, it bookends two fantastic seasons in the Liberty A-League and the Isuzu Ute uh, men's competitions. But, you know, when you look at it, I mean, how many young kids would have been watching? They're going to want to play. You know, I'm sure there'll be a bunch of new, um, you know, wannabe uh, registrations from a lot of young players. And it's actually a good time now. What are we, sort of late November? Usually the World Cup's on mid-year, mm -hmm. so clubs can't kind of can't um, take them on. I know a lot of the NPL trials have already taken place, but there's certainly spots for uh, kids out there who want to play for their local community clubs uh, all around Australia. So I, I imagine just the, you know, the supply and demand, that'll be the biggest issue with clubs and coaches and, and also facilities. So, um, you know, we had the federal sports minister here. I know Mark Schwarzer was pretty big uh, um, on, you know, the, the junior registration fees, um, facilities and, and, you know, female change rooms and, and these kinds of discussions have all taken place, um, you know, over the previous months and years. And, you know, also, um, also talk of um, the, uh, yeah, the lack of facilities. And I think that's something that really, um, or the lack of funding rather from the federal government towards football. So I think all of these things are now becoming a real focus off yep. the back of, um, the Socceroos amazing performances at this World Cup. Great to hear and we'll continue to chat about that throughout the coming days. Now Tom, while Dave was at Socceroos training, we headed off to Denmark. Not to Denmark, the country, Denmark, Denmark's training to hear from uh, Casper Smeichel, Casper Hulman, the coach, uh, Martin Braithwaite, although he didn't say particularly much, I think most of the interest was on the, 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 the um, Schmeichel and Hulman. Um, very friendly and welcoming uh, approach there, I have to say. Casper Cas the friendly coach. Casper the friendly coach, well done. And Daryl. <laughs> and Daryl. Uh, I was so worried I was going to call him Daryl Braithwaite instead of Martin Braithwaite if I ever asked the question. Um, but your impressions uh, of our experience there today, because there's a bit to unpack about this Denmark game going forward, because uh, obviously we know Australia only needs a draw. Denmark have lived this uh, in the Euros in much more... Um, and much more adversity than now, with obviously we having the Christian Eriksen last season, so they know that they can do this. But there's a few questions even internally there in the media uh, heading into this game. Yeah, they, they were terrifically welcoming and hospitable, um, and it was <clears throat> really interesting to, to hear um, the way they engaged with the questions. They were really erudite responses, really mm -hmm. thoughtful answers to questions, talking about Eriksen, about what he brings to the side, but also talking about Australian, the Australian team, Australian players who've played in Denmark, hugely complimentary mm. about their attitude, their application, um, the, the impression they always, the good impression they always leave, um, and absolutely no hostages to fortune whatsoever. Very much, we know that uh, we analyse them even before the Tunisia game. Mm. We know how they'll play. It, that we, that passion is is absolute. We will have to match that. We yeah. have to be as as strong as them. Um, we have to play our own way, but we have to match them when it comes to passion and, and effort and and all that kind of stuff. And it was, um, yeah, it was a really uh, interesting experience. Coach was very... some uh, nuts there as well, I'm led to believe. And some dried fruit. Wow. Dates, even goji berries. Unbelievable. Yeah. You must have really enjoyed it. It was a, uh, it was a high point in, uh, you know, uh, World Cup media-based catering, definitely, in my entire career. <laughs> and when we got down to work, uh, we found that Human, as you said, was, was very ex ex expansive in his answers and very respectful. But Dave, and, and coaches tend to say, you know, that type of thing about Australian football, um, 
you know, that we know we have to match them physically. We're going to be in for a tense battle. We remember them from a couple of years back. Um, the players we've spoken to um, have also said that they, they know they're going to go up for a fight and they're gonna, they know it's a cup final and doesn't surprise them that it's come to this for them. However, some of the narrative around the side is interesting. Obviously, on paper, a really outstanding side. You rattle off the Tunisian. If you do the same thing for the Denmark side, this is a side of high pedigree. I have to say, before the draw came out, like when it took me that long, long view on predictions, I actually had them probably making the semi-finals as a bolter. So when the draw came out, I was like, well, hang on, this, is, this isn't great. However, outside of Eric, Ericsson, um, and Pierre-Emil Hoiberg, and probably Joachim Anderson, um, as good as the squad is, the rest of them probably had a, a few nibbles with injury, maybe not playing as much at, at club level, even someone like Cassius Michaels on at Leicester anymore. And there's a bit of narrative around some of the press that... Um, Maybe this is not going to be as straightforward as the odds would suggest. Yeah, I mean, it's still a bloody good team. You, you look at, especially that defence, I mean, Simon Kaya from AC Milan and Andreas Christensen um, at Barcelona mm. scoring the equalising goal the other night before uh, France went ahead again to score what proved to be the winning goal. Um, it's a really, really impressive team, but... I think psychology plays a big part here. Speaking to one of the Danish reporters today, he said that expectations have never been higher yeah. going into a major yeah. tournament. Um, they obviously won Euro 92. Expectations were pretty low in that going into that tournament because they didn't even qualify. They got to call about a, a week story. out yeah. to, uh, to go and enter because obviously Yugoslavia um, had, to, uh, had to pull out with uh, the war breaking out in the Balkans at the time. But this is... This is their golden generation. They've had some amazing players, some amazing squads over the years, over the decades, you know, players like Laudrup, etc., Peter Schmeichel. But this is the team they thought, you know what, we can actually do some damage here and, and get to the semi-finals. I get the sense that this team's been weighed down by those expectations. Um, even if some of these players are a little bit off, I mean, I, have a look at the Socceroos. I mean, Harry Sutar's played one game in... 10 months coming into this uh, this tournament, um, you know, Atkinson, Rolls, so many of them have had their, their injury issues. So I, I do genuinely think that, uh, yeah, I mean, you look at the Belgians who've, who've struggled in this tournament again. For me, that's psychological because those players, they're an unbelievable group of players. And when they play for their clubs, they're firing on all cylinders. So... A lot of people, including on Keep Up, some of the you know A League greats and former um, greats, actually tipped Denmark to you know potentially top the group and give France a, a real shake. But at the moment, they've been really underwhelming. It's still potentially really dangerous for the Socceroos because oh, yeah. they can still win. They can still get out of the group. Um, anything's possible. So if anything. You know, maybe it's been a bit of a wake-up call for them. But um, look, thus far, they've been hugely disappointing. Uh, the, your point about the expectation or expectations on them, I think, plays into what something that I've felt quite strongly is they look like an old team. Adult, uh, particularly against Tunisia, they really struggled. For, uh, it was an afternoon kickoff in Italy, but they struggled for tempo. And, and it's not dissimilar to France. They had patches against France. But when you actually look through the team... Other than, I mean, Kasper Schmeichel is 36, but um, my, you know, Martin Braithwaite, oh, he's 31. Um, Yusuf Paulson's still only 28. There's, there's a lot of, um, Hoiberg's still only 27. They're not actually that old. They, they've been around for a long time. They've amassed a lot of caps, but they should, I think, be playing with more no, tempo. And I think your theory is an interesting one as to why they're not. They should be in their prime. What I, I, observing the game, and I managed to do the dash and get to the second game yesterday, and do two games in a day. And I, I, for all the criticism that Socceroos got against France for not being on the front foot, arguably Denmark were more conservative. They went to the break playing in a largely low to mid block and only really looking to hit, hit you know, in, in pockets. Um, and then trying to digest that with some of the expectations. And then Thomas Sorensen on Keep Up, Denmark's legend, he, he came into the tournament and said, despite some of the great players we've had in the past, this is the best squad we've ever had to the point that you know, there is an absolute buzz around Denmark whenever they play at home. Um, and with all that in mind, there's a little bit of a similar narrative to what it is with Gareth Southgate in England, is were they too conservative? Did they play with the shackles on? And, and for me, as soon as they went on one nil down, pushed the wing-backs up higher, they looked fantastic. Fantastic. Hugo Lloris had to make a great save. That's where I've still got the caution for the Socceroos game, but wondering whether they can free themselves with that mentality um, and also, is it a mentality thing or is it a tactical thing? Will there be questions that the coach asked? 
be on the tournament if they don't succeed. So we'll get into the weeds a little bit more on that in the coming episodes. We just wanted to touch on with the listeners today our experiences at Denmark training. Uh, we were able to uh, chat to a few of the players, uh, media. Uh, we've spoken to Thomas Sorensen, legend. So we're getting a good smattering of opinions, which yeah. you can read on Keep Up, about this opponent. Where, of course, we need a draw, they need to win. Um, gents, quickly around the grounds, because it's been a really interesting day today. Japan, wow, they've blown an opportunity to take a control of the, the group with Costa Rica, Spain and Germany, because they lost 1-0 to Costa Rica, largely against the run of play. What an opportunity that would have been for, for Japan. Um, <clears throat> uh, also led on today, as you alluded to, Tom, Morocco 2, Belgium 0. I mean, that's... There've been a couple of boil overs in this tournament, but that is a pretty damn big one. Dave, you're at Croatia, Canada. Croatia four, Canada one. Coming back from one nil down after a really early goal. And so why are you wearing a funny, <laughs> funny red and white checked thing up with the tablecloth? Didn't think you'd notice. <laughs> Thanks for getting dressed up for the occasion. And My Tom, pleasure. And Tom, we had a look at Spain against Germany. So some closing thoughts on the action today. Well. I'll speak about the Croatia game first, having been uh, at that match. Canada, Alfonso Davies scored after a minute or so. Uh, there was a real wake-up call for for the Croatian team. There was actually a really uh, a, a really decent contingent of Canadian fans, which was really interesting and great to see, considering they are co-hosting the next World Cup, along with USA and Mexico. And uh, a long time since they've qualified for a World Cup. So, um, yeah, just... Interesting sort of hearing and, and, and seeing some of the commentary from, uh, from some of those fans. But anyway, uh, once Croatia settled, got their foot on the ball, got back into the game, scored an equalising goal, then it was, uh, it was one-way traffic. So Andre Kramaric, the Hoffenheim striker, scoring a double, and uh, Marco Livaya from Haybrook split. Interesting because he scored a, a, a cracking goal playing up front, essentially replacing uh, Mandzukic in that, in that role. Interesting that you mentioned Mitch Duke and uh, being told he's not allowed to play five aside because Levea basically plays five aside every few days in his native uh, Hegel, in his native split, which is probably explains why he's never really cracked it at uh, any of the clubs that he's been to around Europe. So he's kind of a, a really intriguing cat that one. But uh, yeah, look, Croatia got to the final um, of the last World Cup, and that was a big one for them. Face uh, Belgium in the in the, um, their final game. Mm. Good effort on the pronunciation. I think you need to work a bit harder though. <laughs> um, Belgium, Croatia, which is a, a, a blockbuster game coming into the tournament, even bigger now, even bigger now with Belgium's form. Uh, what a ball. That, that would be an absolute... If you talk about generations and opportunities to win, they go out here, that's done. Their window... You know, in Australian jargon, their premiership window, see you later, it's gone. Yeah, look, they're still producing quality players. They've got a good competition, but this group, which is a fantastic group, and you've already lost a few of them, you know, Vincent Company, etc., Fellaini, um, over the last few years. I guess some people debate whether Fellaini was uh, how good he was, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it is, it's 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 uh, it's closing. Um, at the moment, they're on, uh, they're on th- three points. Yeah, so but Croatia four, Morocco four, Belgium three, Canada on zilch. So, uh, yeah, huge. Will be interesting to see how that plays out. Obviously, Morocco playing Canada simultaneously in that last game, but Croatia, the word coming out of the camp after the game was they want to go for uh, for the win against again against uh, Belgium. Absolutely. Now, Tom, right, we walked away from Spain, Germany. Really interesting game. Didn't quite hit any uh, f- great heights, um, but we walked away after that one all draw thinking we probably didn't see the world champions in action. Not at this stage. Um, Germany effectively trying not to lose, trying to get on the break. Spain more direct, than much more direct than the previous generation were, and not the necessary physicality to do that. They kept running aground on the German defence. There were some interesting passages. Technically, it was a, you know, the quality of the game was shown by the short amount of injury time because the ball was actually in the way a lot. Uh, tends to happen with Spain, um, and I, in, it was a, you know it was a good atmosphere as well. I just you just look at the, the two teams in, in transition the, at different stages of the transition. Spain have got this, all these fantastic youngsters, and then play like Busquets pulling the strings in the middle. Germany. They're still, I mean, they're playing Thomas Muller as striker at 33. It sort of speaks to the, the, the development of proper strikers in, in German football. There's an interesting theory I was reading about that Guardiola and, and others, you know, around 
eight, ten years ago, playing false nines, actually re clubs were looking for a different kind of striker. Mm -hmm. Now that you know, um, so many teams are playing with proper old-fashioned number nines, there, there aren't any coming through. And interestingly, it was Nicholas Falkrug who, who came on. Who is a proper number and nine. that was a proper old proper number nine, nine goal. Yeah. Twenty-nine-year-old um, target man, beast. And uh, was playing in the Bundesliga too last season, so it's an extraordinary story. Yes. And they needed that at that point. They needed something just to to, to make a dent into the Spanish side. Uh, it was just a strange putting the finger on what German Germany style of play was and what they were in that game. The thing for me as a fan watching that on as a neutral to see the three youngsters Musiala, Pedri, and Gavi in the flesh. Mm. I wonder what we talk about in ten years when we reflect back on we saw them when they were just coming through because. Uh, in fits and starts, they you could see how special they are. The close control, the, the vision, the the audacity of Musiala, but also the poise of the other two. Um, does help when Busquets is behind you as a, as a safety blanket. Well, maybe it's my age, but I was loving watching Busquets, Neuer, and uh, Muller, the three players remaining from the squads of 2010 when those two last met. Muller, of course, actually missed the semi-final because he was suspended, but uh, he was 20 then. He was the leading scorer at that tournament. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in the blink of an eye, they are nulled veterans. <laughs> <laughs> they are indeed. They are indeed. It's, and I remember uh, watching ahead of that 2010 World Cup, I was doing opposition scouting, and I remember watching in the first time I saw Ozil, Kadira, Kadira, these guys in the flesh. It was a friendly against Hungary. They scored three 0 Yeah, and, but you just thought, wow. These guys are special and yeah, they've had great careers. But uh, yeah, also Alvaro Morata, another uh, striker. Um, some finish, more of the old yeah, fashioned type. Finish. Yeah, <laughs> top finish, but also they started without a, a striker essentially. No, and that, and that, was a good, that was a good change by Enrique. Mm. If they just needed a bit of a focal point and he added a real directness and they gave him that. And, and, and well, within a couple of minutes, he actually put a beautiful finish away. So at least one positive for Spain as well is that the Morata narrative during the Euros was, was a bit all-encompassing. He's got the goal out of the way. They can move on and, and build on that. And look, they'll be there or thereabouts. It's just, there was a, there's just too many... For a team that loves position, there were too many panic turnovers from Spain today that made me wonder whether a more ruthless side than Germany... A couple of them just said that more. A more ruthless side than Germany would actually put them away. Um, gentlemen, it's time for bed, I think. <laughs> time to wrap up this podcast, but great to catch up with you as always and to wrap up a day, uh, particularly when we've been out and about and, and having a look at all the sights and sounds of the World Cup. Tom, Dave, thank you very much. Pleasure. Our pleasure and look forward to coming back tomorrow and, and giving you a bit more of an update on the soccer. We've had a very low-key session today. They're basically walking on bikes recovery, but I think we'll get a bit more of an idea over the next day or so as to uh, what Graham Arnold's thinking selection-wise. Indeed, indeed. Everyone out there, thank you again for listening to the Keep Up In Qatar daily podcast. And until the next episode, enjoy all World Cup action.